very much, Steve. Well, good, e good evening, everybody, and thank you very much indeed for joining me uh, this evening to hear this uh, in the series of talks, 45 in 45 minutes. And as Steve has uh, intimated in his introduction, the subject of my talk this evening is as shown on the first slide there, has the 1745 Association found the site of Clooney's Cage? And in this talk, uh, what I want to do is basically two things. I want to tell you about the story of Clooney's Cage, a little bit about its history. Um, and uh, as Steve has briefly mentioned there, of course, it was the place where Bonnie Prince Charlie was hidden for a two week period in early seven, September 1746. And although it's well known about and well documented, as Steve mentioned earlier, nobody's really been able ever to pin down the exact site, the place of Clooney's Cage. Um, so uh, I want to tell you about that and the story uh, behind it in relation to the 1745 Association's expedition in 2017 to try and solve this mystery, to try and find the place where Clooney's Cage was situated. So that's the uh, plan of attack here. But first of all, a little bit of historical background. Now, I know full well that none of you in this audience this evening on the screen need much historical background here. Um, you're well steeped in the, in, in the story here, but I am mindful that this presentation may be uploaded onto other media for uh, possible viewing by a wider audience. So it's probably appropriate that I mention the backdrop is, of course, the 1745-46 Jacobite Rising, which, as we all know, ended on the 16th of April 1746, when the Jacobite army of Bonnie Prince Charlie was comprehensively defeated and routed at the Battle of Culloden, which marked pretty much the end of the Rising. Um, and our story in relation to Clooney's Cage is really uh, a few months after this, but that is most certainly the backdrop, because of course, after Culloden, we know that Bonnie Prince Charlie spent a, almost a five month period wandering around the highlands and uh, outer islands, um, um, fleeing from government troops. Uh, he was on the run with a, a price of 30,000 pounds on his head, but as we know, uh, nobody ever turned him in to get the 30,000 pounds and he was well hosted, hidden, chaperoned and guided um, for all of that period. And, and you can see that his meanderings were far and wide. He came after the Battle of Culloden down the Great Glen, spent some time in Le Haber. He ended up out in the Outer Isles at Ben Becula. Um, he spent some time just south of there at a place called Corradale, where by all accounts, he felt relatively safe and had a reasonably comfortable and enjoyable time. He went up to Stornoway to try and get a ship back to France, but that didn't prove possible. Came back down the Long Isle again and eventually over to Skye, landed in a place called Monkstadt. And uh, if some of you may re recall a previous talk that I've given about the events surrounding his arrival on Skye at Monkstadt. Eventually down to Portree, across to Raze, um, back from Raze, uh, down to Elgol in the south of the sky, over again to the mainland. Some more perambulations around the Western Highlands and Loch Arbor before eventually ending up down towards the bottom right hand corner of the screen you see, you see before you there, where he ended up um, very close to Achna Carry, uh, Cameron of Loch Eel's estate, and eventually um, was escorted down to Clooney's Cage, which is the little place I have shown there in the bottom right of the map, uh, surrounded by a red oblong squashed circle there. And that's uh, the centre of our story here. And the last blue line indicates his, his um, subsequent movement out to Loch Nanua, where he was picked up uh, by a French ship and escaped on the 19th of September. So quite an odyssey he had over five months. Um, and of course, he had many adventures and hardships en route. He was frequently in a state of physical hardship and danger. He was almost captured by Hanoverian uh, forces, redcoats, militia at various times. He had many scrapes, uh, came through them all, um, met Flora MacDonald, whose picture you see there, uh, who, um, who assisted him back over to Skye, etc. Um, it was quite a journey. And of course, 
His wanderings are very well documented and written about. There have been a number of books, and here's just three of them. Um, Hugh Douglas and Michael J. Stead, The Flight of Bonnie Prince Charlie. Um, Eric Lintlater, The Prince in the Heather, about his time on the run. And finally, not forgetting, Walking with Charlie, In the Footsteps of the 45 by our very own Steve Lord. And as we were discussing before we commenced the presentation there, a few of us were anyway, Steve, um, 20 odd years ago, walked the entire route of Charles's um, wanderings through the heather and the, the isles along the route I've just shown you on the map. Um, he spent uh, a, a number of uh, visits and, and uh, periods uh, retracing those steps. And then eventually he wrote a very good book that you see in the center of the screen there. And uh, I would thoroughly recommend it to everybody. It's a good book in which he recounts um, his own experience, but also draws on the history of uh, the Charles's progress during those five months. So there we are, I would recommend that. So Steve, I'll get that tenor from you later on as agreed. Okay, so let's get back here to Clooney's cage, which um, came towards the end of that period of flight through the heather. And most specifically here, I want to tell you about the man who built the cage or more likely, the man whose clansman built the cage for him. Well, who was he? Well, as you see here, he was Ewan McPherson of Clooney. So let's just delve a little bit into him. Who was Ewan McPherson of Clooney? Well, he was the 12th chief of the clan McPherson, um, and he lived in the period 1706 to 1764. In fact, he assumed uh, the position of chief of the clan around about the time of the 45, when his father passed away. As well as being a clan chief in his own right, um, he was very well connected with um, Jacobite uh, chiefs in the higher echelons of um, the, uh, the clan system, uh, particularly the Jacobite clans. He was the son-in-law to Simon Lord Lovett, the old fox. He married um, one of Simon's uh, daughters. And in fact, he was also the cousin of Donald Cameron of Lochiel, or as we know him, the gentle Lochiel. Although he was out in the 45 and commanded the McPherson clan regiment, in fact, he didn't quite start the rising in that mode. Um, uh, when the rising first began and Charles arrived and he raised his army and standard at Glenfinnan, um, Clooney McPherson had been persuaded by the government actually to take command of one of the independent Highland companies that the government was raising to counter the rising. Um, and he, he did that for a little bit of time initially, but when the Jacobite army reached Perth, um, uh, they arrested uh, Clooney McPherson um, in the town there, or who knows, we don't know, but possibly McPherson positioned himself such that he could be arrested because he then conferred with um, senior people in the Jacobite army, most notably um, Lord George Murray, and uh, was, lo and behold, uh, persuaded to change sides. And he joined the Rising and he returned to his clan land area in Badenoch. Um, that's for your awareness, the region around Can you see Newton Moor, if you're familiar with that part of the Highlands. And he proceeded to raise an, a regiment 350 strong to join the Prince's army. Um, by the time that had been raised, um, uh, they didn't get south to Edinburgh in time to take part in the Battle of Preston Pans, uh, but they joined the Jacobite army in late October and they took um, part in pretty much uh, most of the rest of the Rising. They marched into England all the way down to Derby to the high water mark of the Rising, retreated obviously with the army up towards Scotland again, and indeed um, the McPherson clan regiment played a very prominent part in the skirmish at Clifton, that famous rearguard action, where they very successfully held off the forward element of um, government forces, enabling the, the remainder of the army to move northwards. In fact, a contemporary account says that this brave action was chiefly owing to the courage of the McPhersons, commanded by Ewan McPherson, their chief, who behaved most gallantly on this occasion. They then took part in the Battle of Falkirk and acquitted themselves well in that. And subsequently, when the army moved north, just before the Battle of Culloden, the McPhersons took part in the, the famous 
lightning raids into Athol country, where they eliminated quite a number of uh, government militia outposts and, of course, laid siege to um, to uh, Athol's castle there, Blair Castle. They were on their way back up towards Inverness, uh, but were unable to get back in time to take part in the Battle of Culloden. So they weren't present, but they were able to act as a rear guard and shield the army as the rump of what remained of it moved south and um, mustered at Ruthven. So um, then, of course, as we all know, word came from Charles, who had already started his, um, his flight in the heather, that um, he was not proposing to continue the rising and uh, uh, encouraged those in the army to shift for themselves, as it were. So the army dispersed, as we know, and Macpherson's clansmen surrendered in uh, June of 1746 under amnesty. Macpherson, of course, himself uh, didn't surrender because he realised full well that if he were to do so, he would be he would be hung off for the chop or whatever. So he, in fact, went into hiding, amazingly, for nine years until he escaped to France in 1755. And it was during this period in the early part of those nine years that he constructed Clooney's cage on Ben Alder sometime after Culloden as one of his hideaways. And um, this is the place where uh, Bonnie Prince Charlie and others were concealed uh, in the period uh, 3rd to the 12th or 13th of September 1746. So that's the background of, of Clooney McPherson and his regiment and how he came to be in hiding and um, to, to, to construct this hideaway high on Ben Alder, which came to be known as Clooney's Cage. Now, I've looked high and low to see if I can find a picture of Clooney McPherson, whether he was painted or whether there's any, ever been any illustrations of him, and I, I could find virtually nothing. Um, however, I did find this illustration, which you see before me, which tells an interesting little story, a little cameo along the route of this tale, in as much as it tells a story of an occasion where Clooney, who's pictured on the left of this picture, was during that period of nine years in hiding. At one stage, he was hiding in the house of one of his principal kinsmen in Badenoch, one of his relatives. He was skulking and, and concealing himself for a period in this house. And all of a sudden, a party of government redcoat soldiers appeared at the house and immediately surrounded it. And it seemed as if Clooney would be taken and arrested and that the game would be up. But um, Clooney, it seems, was a, a man of great presence of mind and a cool head. And he immediately ordered one of the servants in the house to, to take off his clothes and then um, Clooney took off his clothes and he put on the servant's clothes to appear as if he was a sergeant, a servant. And then he uh, stepped straight out into the courtyard of the house just as the officer in charge of the soldiers came into the courtyard on his horse, namely one Ensign Monroe. And Clooney promptly played, played the part of the dutiful servant of the house coming out to hold the reins of the visitor's horse whilst he dismounted and went about his business. And that's what happened. Ensign Monroe got off his horse, organised his soldiers to search the house. And of course, they didn't find anyone there. They didn't find Clooney. And uh, they came out empty handed, therefore. But when Ensign Monroe remounted his horse, he thanked what he thought was a servant for holding his horse during the period of the search. And in fact, gave him a shilling <laughs> before he went on his way. So interesting little story of how um, some of these Jacobites had to evade capture and what went on during those years following Culloden. So that's the only picture I've got of Clooney and it's from the rear, but there you go for what it's worth, that's him. So, <clears throat> and I want to talk to you about a bit more about the cage and how we know about it. Well, we know about it largely from information contained in that great treasure trove of information the Lion in Mourning, which was compiled, as we know, by the Reverend Robert Forbes in the years after the Rising, when he put together all sorts of contemporary accounts, um, written accounts, letters, all sorts of information about all aspects of the whole Rising. And in volume three, there are some accounts of what exactly um, 
uh, happened uh, at, at Clooney's Cage and what it was like. And I just want to share a few of these with you before I get on to tell you about what we found when we mounted our expedition in 2017 to try and find the place. So here's some important information about the cage. So we've got here um, one Donald McPherson, um, uh, who wrote in the Lion, who, whose account in the Lion in Mourning talks about the prince coming to Achna Carry and that here he remained for two or three nights and from thence removed to a very romantic, comical habitation made out for him by Clooney at two minutes further distance from Ben Alder called The Cage. It was a real curiosity and can scarcely be described to perfection. It was situated in the face of a very, and I've got this white thing in the way now, so I'm finding it difficult to read this. Hang on. See if I can get this out of the way. Sorry about this, I've got this problem again. It's, okay. quite, it's quite clear on our screens, Glenn. I don't know why it's okay. not on yours. Okay, I, I think I've removed the obstacle now. Um, uh, so a two miles further distance into Ben Alder called The Cage, it was a real curiosity and scarcely and can scarcely be described to perfection. So situate in the face of a very rough hewn rocky mountain called Letter Nilishik, which is still a part of Ben Alder, full of great stones and some scattered wood interspersed. He goes on to say, it was constructed from boulders, felled timber and ropes, concealed in a thicket of trees, thatched over with the heather and twigs, and featured a natural stone hearth fireplace for warmth and cooking between two large rocks leaning against each other. Now, I would particularly ask that you remember this sentence when I then go on to show you some photographs of what we found. So, a natural stone hearth fireplace for warmth and cooking between two large rocks leaning against each other. He goes on to say this whole fabric hung, as it were, by a large tree which reclined from the one end all along the roof to the other and which gave it the name of the cage. And by chance there happened to be two stones at a small distance from each other in the side next the precipice resembling the pillars of a bosom chimney. And here was the fire placed between these two stones. The smoke had its vent out there all along a very stony plat of the rock which and the smoke were altogether so much of a colour that anyone could make no difference in the clearest day, the smoke and the stones by and through which it passed being of such true and real resemblance. So what he's describing there is a situation where between these two um, big rocks leaning together, there was a fire in the, the cage, and then there was a sort of natural stone um, flue, if you like, of rocks above it, and when the smoke from the fire came out of the top of these rocks, it dissipated against the face of a grey, craggy cliff face that rose from the site of the cage behind it. In other words, the smoke was grey, the, um, the face of the cliff was grey, the smoke dissipated above it such that, and this is the important point, it could not be seen from down below. In other words, um, the fact that they were burning a fire would not give their position away and I think that's quite an important part of the tale here. The cage was no larger than to contain six or seven persons, four of which number were frequently employed in playing at cards, one idle looking on, one baking and another firing bread and cooking. Now um, we also know that um, uh, the cage was made famous by um, appearing in uh, Robert Louis Stevenson's famous book, Kidnapped, which as we know, was set in the times uh, just after the Jacobite rising of 1745, 46. And in chapter 23, uh, Stevenson uh, set a scene in uh, the cage as derived from the information, no doubt he'd, he'd seen uh, from the Lion and Mourning. And in various editions of Kidnapped over the, over the years, there have been various different graphical depictions of what the cage might have looked like. And here are some of them. Here's one from one book, quite unlikely, I think, because it shows um, a stone built structure with a window uh, and, uh, and, and furniture. So I think that's perhaps a bit unlikely. Here's another one, which might have been perhaps a bit more what the cage might have been like. 
So uh, I, that's the one that I think most likely, although whether or not they would have been equipped with fine crystal glasses to um, toast the king over the water, I think it's perhaps unlikely. You see a depiction of uh, Bonnie Prince Charlie on the left there, and they're raising a glass, no doubt, to the health of his, his father um, in, in Rome. I, I think that it might have looked something like that. And then I have another one for you here from another version of Kidnapped, another publication. Um, I think that one's quite unlikely. It shows once again um, stone built structure and a stone built floor. Um, uh, none of the contemporary accounts indicate that it was anything such, uh, anything of such a, a permanent structure. But nevertheless, I think it's interesting to note that Clooney's cage uh, was perhaps made famous and, and perhaps became a sort of fabled place, partly through its appearance in Kidnap by Robert Louis Stevenson. So who was there and what was it like during this period when Bonnie Prince Charlie was concealed there? Well, who was there? Charles himself, Clooney Macpherson himself, Cameron of Lochiel, or as we know him, the gentle Lochiel of the 45, um, his servant, Alan Cameron, um, Dr. Archie Cameron, Lochiel's brother, and I was just mentioning to Steve before we started, brought to mind the excellent um, visit some of us had to London earlier this year for the St. George's Garden event when we visited a, a very fine royal chapel where uh, Dr. Archie is buried, in fact, under the altar, surprisingly. Um, Macdonald of Glengarry, so he was one of um, uh, Macdonnell of uh, Glengarry's principal um, Taxman and kinsman, uh, Macpherson of Brecachy, and, and a few of Clo Clooney's servants. So you might have had nine or ten people, perhaps, at any one time in this hideaway. Macpherson, Donald Macpherson, also tells us, and by the way, it's not quite easy to, to work out who Donald Macpherson was that's giving this account, although I have an idea that he might have been Clooney's son. Um, Clooney had a son, Donald. Um, although Donald is a very common name in uh, Highland Gaelic speaking um, circles and families, so it might have been somewhere else. It's difficult to tell, but he, he obviously um, was around at the time and uh, knew what had gone on. He also tells us, therefore, that there was plenty of mutton newly killed and an anchor of whiskey of 20 Scotch pints with some good beef sassers made the year before and plenty of butter and cheese and besides a large well-cured bacon ham. Hooray! So they were certainly well provisioned, not short of a drop or two or, or something to eat. So we're getting a picture of what it might have been like concealed in Clooney's cage. So where is this? I want to just orientate you here about where we're talking about before I talk about our expedition. So there's Ben Alder in the centre of this map of the central western highlands. So uh, just to orientate you, if you look um, to the west of where I've shown Ben Alder, um, to, to its left as you look at it on the map, you can see Fort William, if that helps you to place this, just to the northeast of it, you'll see Dalwhinnie, which many of you will know um, from being on the A9 up to Inverness. And then if you look just to the east and, and south of east, you'll see Pit Lochry. So if that gives you an idea of where we're talking about here. And we do know from all these accounts that the cage was definitely situated somewhere on Ben Alder. So what about our exp expedition then in 2017? Well, as Steve said earlier on in his introduction, um, the exact position of the cage has been a mystery for 270 odd years. Um, and in 2017, um, the association thought it would mount an expedition to see if we could find the cage, having consulted the relevant documents. So an expedition was indeed mounted in June of that year. I think it was organised actually by Mike, um, uh, Mike, our chairman, who, who put this in motion. And um, uh, this map here shows the route of our expedition. So if you look down at the bottom there, you'll see the Bridge of Erecht at the western end of Loch Rannach. So um, that's where we started the expedition. We mustered there in a very fine um, bed and breakfast, I seem to remember, it was six or seven of us, bed and breakfast that did dinner. So we had a fine dinner, a couple of nice little glasses of red wine, um, a bit of a briefing about where we were going and what we were doing. Um, and then an early night, and then the next morning um, after breakfast, we set off on our expedition along 
the orange line there that I've um, included in this map that you see going north from Bridge of Erecht. Erecht. So initially we progressed along that track you can see there and the estate whose um, permission we had to um, get in order to mount this expedition. They were good enough to provide us with a couple of four wheel drive type vehicles. So we all piled into those and we moved northwards um, for 15 or 20 minutes, 25 minutes maybe. And we got as far as the southern edge of Loch Erecht. They are just next to a feature on the map there. You can see shown as Thron Vec, which is Gaelic for little nose. And uh, there we had to dismount because the track came to an end. So uh, saying goodbye to our drivers, we then pushed on on foot all the way um, around the southwestern end of Loch Erecht. Um, up on that curved uh, orange line that I can, I've drawn on there until we arrived at a place called um, the Bay, uh, Alder Bay, which is that little triangular niche you can see in the, uh, on the western shore of the loch at the top of that orange um, line. So this is where we were. So we then got to um, Alder Bay. You can see on that little sliver of an OS map there. And we set up shop at Ben Alder Cottage, which you can see two photographs of there. Um, ben Alder Cottage is now no longer lived in by anybody in particular, and it's one of the many bothies for hill walkers in Scotland. So we set ourselves up there, um, and by this time it was possibly about 11 o'clock in the morning. We'd already had um, about two, three hours worth of, 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 of walking and driving to get to here. And here is uh, a number of men in the intrepid party. Um, none of us in the first flush of youth, but all of us ready and willing to proceed on the expedition to find Pliny's cage. Um, so um, from left to right there, you've got um, uh, Jim King in, in the yellow top and jacket and next to him, Michael Cook. And then standing in the doorway there looking very shady indeed is uh, our very own Steve Lord. And then next to him, Mike, of course, uh, the, the, the chairman, and, uh, and then um, Peter Brown uh, on the edge there. So and I'm not in that photograph because yours truly was taking that photograph. So there you go, a fine body of men, as you can see, with um, uh, a, a, an equally fine arrangement of outlandish hatware, uh, of hats and headwear. Um, so that's where we set up shop, had a cup of tea, I seem to remember, girded our loins, to set off into the hills um, to find Clooney's cage. So how did we go about this? Well, first of all, this is the sort of site that we beheld. Um, as you can see, the weather was quite foreboding. Uh, we, we thought we were gonna get soaking wet, um, but in fact, it, as you'll see in some subsequent photographs, it did clear up. But as you can see, and I include this photograph to give you an idea of the topography all around here, it's barren, it's remote, it's unforgiving. Um, just the sort of place that you would want to hide if, uh, if people were trying to get you and um, take you into captivity. Um, and that is a, a closer photo of one part of Ben Alder. So this is the sort of thing that we saw as we set out. So how do we go about this? Well, here's a wider map, OS map uh, section of Ben Alder. Um, and uh, you can see there we are down starting at Ben Alder Cottage, just at the head of Alder Bay there. And as I remember, I think we divided into three groups. So a couple of people went off in the easterly, easterly direction along that track you can see along the shore of Alder Bay, round the corner of the headland and up um, towards um, that feature there, which you can see called Corrin and Trav, which is Gaelic for Corrie of the Bones, in fact. Um, and the party went up there scouring amongst the rocks and uh, looking upwards to see whether there were any likely places. But in fact, that group were, didn't seem to find anything as, as far as I'm aware. Incidentally, uh, whilst I'm over on the east side of this map, Steve um, mentioned earlier on in his introduction that somebody in the 1990s thought they had found the site of Clooney's Cage on the other side of Loch Erecht, which you see here. In fact, it was uh, they uh, suggested that a site for Cluny's cage was down right in the bottom right hand corner of the of the map you can see there at a place called at a feature called Kregna Hjollera 
which is Gaelic for Rock of the Eagle. Um, but I, I, I think largely that's unlikely to have been the place. First of all, it's not on Ben Alder. Ben Alder is on the opposite side of the water. Um, and also, we had a close look at that from over the other side. It'd be virtually impossible to get up there. Uh, that's possibly one reason why it was situated there. But all of the accounts indicate it was on Ben Alder, on the on the on the on the west side of the loch. And in the accounts that that I've read about, you know, when Charles left to go to Loch Nanua and and pick up the French ship, there was no mention of going round a loch or getting a boat over the loch. I think they left on foot, all of which indicates that it was on the west side in, in the in the somewhere on that Ben Alder massive. So the second group um, went up, uh, took the middle road, the middle path northwards. You can see there from Ben Alder Cottage up, uh, up uh, towards the Bialach Brepach, which means in Gaelic the, the kicking pass. And they proceeded up there to see whether um, they could find any likely spots. And incidentally, I should mention that just to the right of that path, you will see a feature entitled Prince Charlie's Cave. And you'll be wondering, well, is that it? You know, what, what's that all about? Well, no, that's not it um, for a couple of reasons. First of all, um, uh, he didn't hide in a cave. He, he hid in, in a structure that we know to be the cage. Um, and secondly, we had a close look at that and it's pretty much just a large boulder. Um, there's not really any cave there. And, 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 and thirdly, I don't think he would have hidden right next to a, a confluence of paths where people were likely to be passing, possibly parties of redcoat soldiers. So that's most unlikely. However, it's interesting to reflect upon the fact that probably in the 19th century, when um, somebody from the government came to do the groundwork to create this ordnance survey map, it's known that they asked local people for the names of different features um, and, and, uh, and probably they were told that Bonnie Prince Charlie had hidden here or hereabouts at some stage and, and the person who drew up the map just thought, right, I'll plonk it there, I don't know. But that's definitely not where it was. But it does indicate, it does provide some evidence to support the fact that it was in this vicinity. Before I get on to the third path, interesting also, um, to note that some of the accounts say that at the time that this was a partially wooded place um, and some people have said well this can't be it because there are not many woods there today well I think we heard from the estate that there had been woods there in previous times and a lot can change in 300 years and indeed if you look right over to the left hand side of the map you'll see a, a, a hilltop there called Bach na Krave, and Krave means trees so, um, you know, I, I think it likely that this area had um, some smattering of patches of trees two or three hundred years ago. Anyway, back to the search for the cage. So the third group, comprising myself, Steve Lord and Jim King, we set off on the west or northwesterly route along that um, red line that I have put upon the map here. So we set off on that track there, which kind of goes northwest and converges with the older burn and we got um, along that route and we checked out a few places I seem to remember Steve had a notion of a possible place that he had seen all those years ago when he walked the route before he wrote his book so we checked that out but we, we weren't entirely sure of that and we came to the area pretty much marked by the end of that red line um, and we're running out of time and, and had to, to turn back and we went off to the left and right we didn't just stick to the path but um, we turned back um, and then we got halfway back to that place where I have shown another red line at right angles to the path and we got to that place there and that other red line leads up to a place which I have ringed there in a blue kind of squash circle and, and this is the place that I'm going to talk to you about now. So when we got to that point there where those two red lines meet, I happened to look up and this is what I saw. I saw this. As you can see, the weather had greatly improved at this, by this time, which was nice. Um, and that was certainly helpful for what was about to ensue. We looked up, I looked up just by chance and I saw just underneath the top right hand corner of that photograph as depicted here, I saw a vertical um, gray cliff face 
and just at the bottom of it, and you can probably discern that yourselves, I saw a lip, an edge, and I thought, I wonder whether over that lip there is a flat ledge, which might be possibly the site of Clooney's cage. It certainly fitted the description, you know, smoke tri trickling up a, a cliff face, and being dissipated and not visible, et cetera, et cetera. So I looked at my watch and it was about half past three to four o'clock. We only had an hour or so before we had to be back at Ben Alder Cottage in order to make the long trip back to Bridge of Erech, et cetera. And I quickly weighed up the situation and decided that it was now or never. And that if we wanted to check this place out, we were going to have to charge up there and have a look at it and we were going to have to do it quickly. So Steve didn't fancy that climb and, 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 and sensibly thought, well, I'll go back and, and tell everyone else where you are and what you're doing. Jim King and I decided to hoof it up there um, to see what we could find. And my goodness, what a climb it was. It's something like 45 or 50 degrees. Difficult climbing over large boulders with big gaps between them, tussocks, really difficult underground, uh, underfoot. And my goodness, it was a lung buster. By the time we got up there, we were exhausted, sweating and panting. But I have to say, um, when I got up the top there with Jim King coming up um, close astern of me, um, it was worth the climb because this is what we found. There was indeed, and there's yours truly up there, there was indeed a ledge up there, which was concealed from view from below. Um, and uh, it was grown over with heather, um, but there was a, 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 a flattish piece of concealed ground in a hollow, um, which was big enough to have a, 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 some kind of structure constructed of the description that we know of Clooney's cage from the lion in mourning. But more than that, I saw this, and you'll see just to just to my right there, you see two large boulders tipped over and leaning against each other. And on top of them is another boulder which forms a capstone, pretty much like the contemporary account descriptions of what appeared at one end of the cage. More than that, imagine my surprise and shock and delight when I crawled underneath that thin, that narrow, crevice between those rocks and I looked up and to my surprise I saw that the undersurface of those rocks was blackened indicating that there may have been a fire there in previous times. Now there had been no fire there in recent times. I scrabbled at it with my, my fingers and, and my fingernails, no soot came off it. Whatever was blackened onto there was well glazed on and had been there for a long long time and neither do I think anybody had been up there um, setting a fire in any recent times. I mean, very, very few people get along the path that I showed you on the very bottom of this mountain, never mind up this mountain, along the route I've just shown you. I think we were the first people to be there for a very, very long time. And yet, under those stones, there were blackened surfaces as if a fire had been um, uh, burnt there at some time. And when we turned around, these were the views that we beheld. First of all, they were beautiful, uh, it turned into a beautiful day. Um, and you can see there in this photograph I took, looking over the edge of the, the, the lip southwards, you can see Loch Erecht, and that's the route we followed when we walked up earlier in the day along the side of that loch. And you can get a feel from this picture that to the south, and if you moved a bit forward from where I took the photograph and looked left and right, to the east and west, you had a panoramic view of the whole countryside um, for miles around. And I think that would have been quite important if this was the site of Clooney's Cage because the people there would get early warning of the approach of anybody from any distance miles around, which would be quite important if they were required to flee at short notice. So um, uh, from that point of view, I think that, you know, that fits the bill as it were. And I think I've got another photograph I've taken uh, over the edge of this lip as it were, and you, you can see there um, what, what a great panoramic view um, you have all around. Here's another one, it's slightly um, canted towards looking over to the east there, and that's Loch Erecht underneath, and you can see a, a, an almost vertical um, uh, green um, 
a cliff face at the other side of the loch there. And, and that, you can see, is the feature I showed you on the map earlier, Crecan Yolera, where that gentleman in the, in the 1990s thought um, uh, Clooney's cage might have been situated. Personally, I think it's more likely to be on this side. Now, just have a close look at this photograph and compare it with a, a painting I'm going to show you in the next slide. So this, this is uh, where we were that day. And this is a picture, um, I, I think probably painted in the 19th century, possibly from you know, uh, somebody having read the contemporary accounts of what it was like at Flooney's Cage. Um, and you can see um, a depiction there of Bonnie Prince Charlie on the left there and uh, a brawny clansman holding him back lest he be, over, be seen from below and others peeping over the lip looking down at Loch Erecht, and it's entitled Clansman Look Down on Loch Erecht for Redcoats with Bonnie Prince Charlie Left Stands Out of Sight. Now, I, I'm not suggesting that this proves that the place I found was the site of a Clooney's cage, but I'll just take you that slide back and compare it again. Don't the two look rather similar? Quite interesting, I thought. So, um, I think that... Um, we found a num number of features up here that um, lend credence to the view that this might have been the site of um, Clooney's cage. First of all, it was on Ben Alder. Um, secondly, it was well concealed. Um, you could not see that from down below. Um, uh, thirdly, it had a, a commanding view of the countryside around, which I think would have been um, uh, a sensible precaution and a likely reason why it would be sighted in a place like that. And, and fourthly, the two enormous boulders leaning against each other um, with a sort of natural flue above them, underneath a, a, a large vertical grey cliff face is pretty much exactly as described by Donald McPherson in his account in The Lion in Mourning. So, all very interesting. So um, after that, uh, we, we got down to Ben Alder Cottage, um, rejoined the party, told them what we found and made our way back. Had another night in the B&B, &B, another couple of glasses of red wine, no doubt, and we all dispersed and went home the next day. Subsequently, however, we were able to generate some um, favourable publicity for the association um, following our expedition to Ben Alder. Um, first of all, um, I can't quite remember how, but somebody at the Scotsman newspaper got wind of this um, and, and we had some engagement with a, with a, a journalist. And uh, in June of 2017, an article appeared in the Scotsman newspaper about our expedition with the title, Has the Real Bonnie Prince Charlie's Cage Been Found? Which is quite good publicity, quite interesting. Um, I wrote an article for the Jacobite which was published in the winter 2017 edition entitled as the 1745 association found Clooney's cage. And uh, if you still have a copy of the winter 2017 edition, you can dig that out if you like and, and reread the article perhaps. And um, we also had some interest from a magazine in the United States called the Highlander, which is apparently has a very wide circulation amongst the, the millions of Scots Sort of people of Scots ancestry and descent and Highland descent in the United States. And uh, I wrote an article from, for them entitled The Search for Clooney's Cage, which was duly published. Um, and, and I'm pleased to say that the association made a small amount of, of money out of that. So that was all good publicity. And then three years later, we heard from this chap here, Paul Merton. Uh, you'll recognize him, the chap from the TV programme Grand Tours of Scotland, which is screened on uh, BBC television. Very good programme, series of programmes in which he tramps the length and breadth of Scotland, mostly in rural and highland areas, looking for places of interest with interesting histories and stories. Um, I, I always enjoy his programmes. Anyway, he got in touch with the association, having, I think, seen the article in The Scotsman. Um, and um, uh, the association, I think Steve put him in touch with me and he phoned me up. So, um, and, and I had two or three long conversations with him on the phone. Very nice guy, actually. He always seems a very pleasant, genial fellow on the television. And indeed, that's exactly how I found him to be. So he wanted to feature our find on one of his programmes. And to cut a long story short, we made an arrangement whereby Jim King and I 
would meet him uh, one day, I think in May of 2020, um, and uh, on a Saturday morning, and he was going to whisk us down um, Loch Erecht in a, in a boat along with a film crew. We were going to disembark at uh, Alder Bay, at uh, Ben Alder Cottage, and I was going to take them all the way up to the place where we had found, uh, along with a film crew. That would have been interesting, getting all that equipment up there. Um, and then we were going to do a piece to camera in which he would interview me and I would say um, pretty much many of the things that I've been talking to you about this evening. And, and then it would be screened on BBC television as one of his programmes. So that was all set up, was looking good. But as you will perhaps have um, derived from the date there, May 2020, uh, an incident occurred which put the kibosh on the whole thing because the COVID pandemic fell upon us and we went into lockdown and the whole thing had to be cancelled. And um, um, although Paul Merton said, look, we'll keep in touch and maybe reschedule this, I don't, I don't think his filming schedule has taken him to that part of Scotland again since. But you never know. It might be something that could be rekindled and you never know. We might get this on TV at some time. So that, that was a bit of a missed opportunity, but out with our control. So um, I've got some final thoughts and questions for you. First of all, has the 1745 Association really found the site of Clooney's cage? To be honest, I can't claim that. I don't know whether we have or not. I'm not claiming definitively that we found the place and neither is the Association. But I think I would say we may well have done. It's quite possible that we have. And I think perhaps the, the place that we have found is, is a credible um, possibility for the actual site of Clooney's cage, but we don't know that for certain, and I wouldn't like to suggest that we do. Is a further site visit required to undertake some metal detecting or some kind of dig for evidence? When Jim and I were up there in 2017, we only had 20 minutes or so to have a good look around before we had to get back down and rejoin the rest. We didn't have a lot of time to do anything other than form an opinion of what we'd seen, take some photographs, and then, then go down the hill. Um, you know, um, perhaps some metal detecting might be required. Indeed, um, we do have a, a, a very capable metal detector in our midst, Paul MacDonald, um, and he's spoken to me about this a couple of times. Um, is it even practical or feasible to mount another expedition? It wasn't easy to do, actually. It took some organising. You've got to avoid the shooting season because it's a shooting estate. You've got to get permissions. Um, it, it, it's no small undertaking probably feasible, but not a small undertaking. What other investigation or research might be undertaken to determine whether or not we've found the site? I don't really have any answers to these questions. Perhaps it's something that the Council of the Association might like to consider in due course. Um, but nevertheless, um, uh, hopefully you found that interesting and you're now a bit more aware of the history surrounding Clooney's cage and perhaps um, uh, aware now of the extent of our expedition, what we did and what we found in 2017. So I hope you found that interesting and enjoyed it. So that completes my presentation and um, I'd now be delighted to field any questions if there's time that anybody might have. Thank you very much.